Everlasting God, you give strength to the weak and power to the faint. Make us agents of your healing and wholeness, that your good news may be made known to the ends of your creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. And like, and is it 
helping her foot to get better? Well, she doesn't have to She used to, then maybe her foot's better now. So that would be really good. So yes, this helps us heal. Jesus in our Bible story today talks about helping people. And Jesus helped Simon, Simon's mother-in-law get better. Um, and Jesus wants us to help too. So let's see, let's think about this. If someone's thirsty, how could we help them? Perfect. How about if somebody's sad? What could we do to help them? Well, that's a really good idea. Ask them if they want to play with you. What a wonderful way to help somebody not be sad. So this week, I want you to... Absolutely right, and you know, it's when someone doesn't play with you, it does make you sad, and that's really nice of you. That's a perfect rule. So, this week, as you see weird things like this, think about how they might help and ways that you might help your friends or other people who might be sad or need your help. Okay, so let's say a prayer Dear Jesus, thanks for helping us and help us to help others. Amen. Thank you. And yes, I can get the volumes. It's a big decision every single week. What color? You want me to rise for the reading of the gospel? The Holy Gospel according to Mark. As soon as Jesus and the disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. And he answered, Let us go on to the neighboring town so that I might proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. I have some really, really vivid memories of praying with and for those who need healing. With a man whose family deserted him, intentionally remaining a stay away, they called and asked me to hold his hand as he took his last breath. That was a sacred moment, to be sure. For the 17-year-old whose body was ravaged by cancer, there were absolutely no words. So the family and I sat together in silence. For my friend, suddenly diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and then just as suddenly gone, there wasn't time to say goodbye, but I shared memories with her husband. For the member of our congregation whose body was found inside his home doused with gasoline, no gas can was ever found, no one was ever certain whether the death was murder or suicide. Our Bible study prayed in his yard for peace in the midst of that tragedy. For the four in the hospital who died in a single night while I was chaplain, I felt absolutely powerless as I scurried from room to room. For the one who died peacefully while her daughter and I sang children's Bible songs. Each death, a story of a life on this earth that has ended, a story remembered, a person remembered, a relationship remembered. As Christians,
Christians, we are invited to enter into people's lives in some incredibly sacred moments. We are present in hard times. We believe and pray and hope for resurrection and life and light. We hold on to the promise of life after death. So what do we do with this text in front of us today? It's a familiar healing text. Like most everything in Mark's Gospel, the healing is done quickly and at top speed. Jesus comes to visit Simon's mother-in-law, who is in bed with a fever, and then with no words, no prayer, Jesus reaches out, takes her hand, and she's healed. I love these miracle stories. I really do, but I also admit that I want my own miracle. I want to sit at a bedside, reach out my hand, and have a person get up and be healed. But it hasn't happened quite like that. A friend of mine was told after her mother died that she didn't pray correctly, or her mother would have lived. Ouch. Are we doing something wrong? Is that why we may not be experiencing these miracles? Or maybe that's not it at all. Maybe we are missing the miracle. When I read one of these healing stories, theologian Robert Brewer reminds me that I need to ask what it says about Jesus. Not what the story says about me, but about Jesus. These healing stories highlight the power of Jesus, the power Jesus has to confront demons, the power Jesus has to conquer sin and death. Did you notice that Simon called Jesus to the home, knowing that Simon himself couldn't help his mother-in-law? Healing his mother-in-law was above his pay grade. Healing is at times above my pay grade, too, which is maybe why I often feel so powerless. It is Jesus who has the power to heal. In these healing stories, I also need to remember that Jesus is right smack in the middle of all of our sin and suffering and sickness and death. Jesus isn't afraid to be with Simon's mother-in-law. Jesus is present. Jesus is there. Although there have been times when I have been terrified to enter a room, answer a call, or even make a call, Jesus has always been with me in hospitals and at gravesides, during the silent nights when the tears flow hard. Jesus has been with all of us as we cry at the bedside of our spouse, or our child, or our grandchild, or our friend. Jesus has been with us when the grief is so great that the words can't even be spoken. Jesus is with us all the way to the cross, suffering his own unspeakable death, saving us from sin and death. Jesus is with us always. In these healing stories, too, it's easy for me to focus on the physical healing. But Jesus is doing so much more. Simon's mother-in-law experienced physical, but also she experienced social healing. She had been separated and alone, and now Jesus brings her back into relationship with family and friends and community. Doesn't that happen with us, too? Praying desperately for a loved one to be healed, our relationship with God cracks open wide as we struggle and we wrestle. Our relationship deepens with the one who is sick and the loved ones who are present, the congregation who mourns. Are these deepened relationships worth the struggle and the pain and the grief that we are experiencing? Absolutely not. But it happens. I mean, these healing stories can often normalize health making it seem that unless we are perfectly healthy, something is very, very wrong. We expect our health never to fail, but physical or emotional pain, chronic illness, and ultimately death are the exception. I was blessed many years ago to bury a woman who died at the age of 96. 
She had lived a long and healthy life, never had been hospitalized. Her death was from old age, and she died in her sleep. Her daughter, though, seriously struggled with God, blaming God for causing her mother to die. Do we ever try and avoid death? And when someone dies, do we ever feel like we need to blame something or someone, even ourselves? The wise old pastor of mine shared with me one day that sometimes healing and wholeness can only be found on the other side of the grave. Truth? So what do we do? We keep praying for miracles. Absolutely, not a doubt. I will forever do this, and I believe in miracles. We also give thanks when the healing does come. We give thanks that a relationship is restored, that pain is lessened, that a person is returned, and that someone is set free from whatever it is that has bound them. We give God thanks. We also sit with those who need care in God's healing. Jesus reached out and took Simon's mother-in-law by the hand. He physically touched her. And I know, there's COVID and RSV and flu running rampant, and physically touching may not always be the best idea. But we can also give a healing touch with our words, our prayers, our music and even our cards. A woman I visited received a card that she still used as a bookmark over a year later. When I would visit her and sit with her, she would touch the card, she would trace the flower on the front, and then she would tell me again all about the person who sent it to her. That card still brought healing even a year later. Sometimes, too, silence is enough. At times we might hesitate to call someone or even write a card or send an email worried that we will say the wrong thing or not enough or make fools of ourselves. The words aren't important, but our presence is. Our physical presence sends the strong and unmistakable message that the one who needs healing is not alone. They are loved and cared for. In these times, in these holy moments of pain, sickness, and death, we remember that Jesus is with us, present, bringing healing and wholeness in all forms. It is in these moments that we see God's kingdom break in now, even if not completely yet. Each glimpse a miracle, to be sure. <coughs> Amen.
Blessed are you, Holy One, for all good things come from you. In bread and cup, you open heaven to us. Meet us at this table, that we receive what we seek, and follow your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love, you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we have regular bread as well as gluten-free wafers. The darker liquid is wine. The lighter liquid in the center is juice. If you would prefer the individual prepackaged communion kits, they are available from the ushers and they contain a gluten wafer as well as um, juice. The table is now ready and all are welcome.
You may be seated for the announcements.
Go in peace. You are God's beloved. Thanks be to God.